Superman, one of the most iconic figures in our modern day mythos. He is so well known that he expands beyond the lexicon of comic book fans. Even if you're not a comic book fan, you know who he is, his origin, and powers. Most people don't understand or relate to Superman, but that's the point. He is a god, and we are just mere mortals. He is the man of the future, the next evolutionary step according to Friedrich Nietzsche. The Ubermensch, or Overman, Sovereign Man, Beyond Man, Future Man, or Superman. He is as far above man as man is above ape. And thus spoke Zarathustra is the book that is the key to unlocking the understanding of the Superman. Nice S. Right here. He's strong, he flies, he's the Nietzschean fantasy ideal all wrapped up in a red cape. The Superman. I have to say, out of all the iterations of Superman I've seen, the Richard Donner film does the best to explain Superman's motivation, his psychology, and understanding of why he likes to help people and save the day. Yeah, I know, you can do all these amazing things and sometimes you think that you will just go bust unless you can tell people about it, huh? In short, Clark Kent is the result of Jonathan and Martha Kent. They raised him in a loving, stable environment. They raised him to be a good man who was moral, honorable, and just. And there's one thing I do know, son, and that is you are here for a reason. I don't know whose reason, whatever the reason is, you know, maybe it's because... Uh, I don't know, it's... Uh... <sighs> but I do know one thing. It's not to score touchdowns. I mean, this is so close to the Spider-Man scene where Uncle Ben tells Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. And these scenes in his home life gives you the whole range of Clark's life experience. Even though Jonathan's only in there for a couple of minutes in the length of the movie, the scene where Jonathan dies is deeply impactful to the audience. All those things I can do, all those powers, and I couldn't even save him. I mean, those scenes right there just tells you everything you need to know about Superman's character, which is a far cry different than the Zack Snyder version. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. There's more at stake here than just our lives. First off, this is the worst Jonathan Kent. He would never imply not to save anyone if you have the power to do so. The Snyder version of The Man of Steel clearly takes his cues from the Richard Donner film. He just wants to be modern and darker and edgier. Jonathan Kent is still alive in the comics and in other iterations. No, son. It doesn't matter where you were born or what you can do. You'll always be Clark Kent. Superman just helps out now and then. Jonathan's death scene in The Man of Steel just doesn't have the same impact. It doesn't even make sense because Clark actually had the power to save him and he let him die. Why? Because if that's my father about to die, I'll be damned if I let him just die like that. There's nothing on earth that's gonna stop me from saving him. And you do know he moves faster than a speeding bullet. He could have saved him and nobody even would have known. To me, the scene doesn't work at all. It's just a poor imitation. It doesn't have any of the impact that the Donner film had. And I know this is off tangent from the philosophical issue, but I can already hear my detractors saying, Oh, you think you can do better? Let's see you write something. Okay, I will. Alright, let's fix this mess. The easiest way to do it and still keep the integrity of the scene, let's give Clark a choice. Now let's put in a school bus full of kids in danger. And Clark has to make a choice. Do I rescue my father or do I rescue the school bus full of kids? Jonathan would interject and say, No, forget about me. Save them. And I don't want to rag on Zack Snyder too much. It is hard writing for an iconic character where everybody knows their mythos. There's a lot of things I don't like about the original story. For example, how do you just send the baby across into outer space? There's no guarantee that it's going to survive. Even with superpowers, there's no way he can take care of himself. You're just hoping he makes it on a whim and a prayer. And forget about the fact that Jor-El knew that the planet was dying and Jor-El should have built a ship that can carry all of them off to safety. I think the George Reeves version was the only one that addressed this issue. The model might carry both of you, Lara. No, I'm not going. You must. My place is here with you. Lara, please, there isn't time. The takeoff pressure's building up in a few seconds I'd now. be lost in a new world without you, jor -El. Apparently it's okay for a baby. Alright, one final rewrite before we move on. Jarrell tells Laura, 
There's only room for the two of you, and I'm going to stay behind. I love you. I love both of you. Laura replies, I love you, and we will never forget you, before she sheds one final tear and goes into the ship and closes the hatch. And so Jorel sacrifices himself to save his wife and child. Laura and Kal-El travel across space till they finally reach the planet Earth, but upon entry into the orbit, they encounter a turbulent landing. So, since they just entered the solar system, they haven't fully absorbed the rays from the yellow sun, giving them their full superpowers. The ship careens out of control, and Laura can only clutch Kal-El as tightly as she can, bracing for a crash landing. They plummet down to an isolated destination known as the Kent Farm. And on that fateful day, a young couple, Martha and Jonathan Kent, would encounter one of the most important days of their lives. The ship crashes and all Laura can do is cover over Kal-El's body. And from the impact, shrapnel just shreds through her body. Jonathan and Martha can see the wreck and from a distance, they can see a hatch opening and a woman clutching a baby. They rush over to help the woman, but she doesn't move. All she can do is stare at Kal-El, making sure he's all right. After realizing he's okay, she looks up at the Kents and desperately tries to communicate with them, but all she can do is gasp. She stares at Martha with pleading eyes, and Martha instinctually knows what she's trying to say. She grabs Kal-El and shakes her head, yes, I will take care of your baby. And with one final breath, Laura slumps over and dies. Well, grab a tissue and wipe those tears away, because we have a thought experiment. If you were given Superman's powers, what kind of person would you be? Would you be virtuous, fighting for truth, justice in the American way? Or would you be a complete dictator and try to rule the world? That was the dilemma presented in Book 2 of Plato's The Republic. Glaucon tells the story of a man named Gyges, who was a moral, virtuous, kind, and honorable man. And then one day he finds a magic ring that gave him the powers of invisibility, which made him the most powerful man in the world. The power of the ring corrupted him, and he ends up seducing the queen, plotted to kill the king, and usurped his throne. Which brings us back to his upbringing, why Martha and Jonathan Kent were so important to his character. In Superboy Season 3, Superboy enters an alternate dimension where Clark Kent never existed, Jonathan and Martha never found him, and this Kal-El, known as the Sovereign, rules the world with a steel fist. You're as strong as I am. People like us were meant to rule. It's our destiny. I'm not sure what my destiny is, but I know it's not this. So what is the Superman according to Nietzsche? Well, to him, it's the next evolutionary phase in man's development. We evolved from ape-like creatures to modern man, and modern man is still evolving to the future man. And in simple terms, the easiest way to describe the Superman is self-command or self-mastery. Self-mastery encompasses your entire existence. It's mastery of all facets of yourself. You have self-command of yourself physically, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically. And in Nietzsche's book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche specifically focused on emotional and psychological development in the Superman. So what is self-mastery over your emotions? Well, think of an animal. If it's threatened, it'll either get hostile and run. If it's happy or sad, it's very demonstrative. Their behaviors are very much dependent on their mood. The problem with a person doing this is you're very susceptible to domination and manipulation. You are not in control of your emotions. Your emotions are in control of you. So I used to assist one Dr. Harry Hohen from Queens College in scuba diving lessons, and he would give me the most difficult students. Well, they needed the most help, so it makes the most sense. And some of them were downright hydrophobic and definitely afraid of the water. So naturally, you take a scuba diving lesson. I don't know how that makes sense. So when you are down underneath the water, you really can't just shoot up to the surface for any reason. Otherwise, you might suffer traumatic arterial air embolism, decompression sickness, or nitrogen narcosis, all of which are fatal. So we have a slogan, panic is not an option. You have to fix all your problems down underneath the water. Because when you do panic, you end up losing all your good judgment. You're almost certain to make stupid decisions that's going to cost you your life, especially underneath the water where your problems are magnified 10 times. So panic is an extreme example of your emotions taking control of your behavior. And I mentioned the people who are hydrophobic before. I always ask them, like, why do you take this class if you're hydrophobic? Well, it turns out they're trying to conquer their fear 
warriors, so to speak. It's actually pretty courageous. This is an example of them trying to take back their lives and not let their emotions control them. And it's not like we've ever seen Superman overly demonstrative and lose control of his emotions in the movie. Oh, not at all. And just to be clear, I'm not implying that you become a robot by suppressing or repressing your emotions. The people with hydrophobia just can't say, okay, I'm not going to be afraid of the water anymore. It's about managing your emotions so you can still remain cognitive and functional above all else. And Nietzsche talks about the importance of developmental morals in the Superman, and it's a little confusing because they come in three distinct phases, but ultimately the Superman is a free thinker that makes his own morals. A Superman isn't just born with innate powers, it's a journey of development and growth. The first phase is the camel stage, where a person learns the value of society and its culture. This is the phase where Martha and Jonathan gave Clark his good moral values, his integrity, his honor, good citizenship, and just made him a decent human being. Clark, what is it? Mom, why am I different from all the other boys? Why can I do things that nobody else can do? Why am I stronger than anybody? After having been grounded in moral values and standing up for society's conventional ethical beliefs, next comes the lion phase, which is like a rebellious teenager that questions society's norms. And through this questioning and refusal of society's norms, it symbolizes death and destruction. After all I've done for them, will there ever come a time when I've served enough? And then with death comes rebirth, represented in the child phase. The child is a creator. It creates new values, new beginnings. It holds no resentments, forgets the past, and creates a new present and brighter future. Which culminates to the Superman, a symbol of hope and transcendence from one's meager existence to realizing their full potential. Superman is the embodiment of the hero in us all, and the light that shines in the darkness to show us the way. They can be a great people, Kal-El. They wish to be. They only lack the light to show the way. For this reason, above all, their capacity for good. I have sent them you, my only son. for watching. If you stuck around for this, I'm not really sure why. Because I really love philosophy and I love talking about it. But I know I couldn't get too deep into it, otherwise I, I can already feel you guys clicking off this video. Like in my Joker video, or my Ghost in the Shell video. Which didn't get a lot of views, but I thought it was deep. And I also wanted to talk more about the history and how Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster created the character of the Superman. I mean, their first iteration of the Superman was actually a, like a Frankenstein monster created by one mad scientist, Professor Ernest Smalley, with the aid of a meteor to create the perfect human being. And I can go on and on all day about this subject, but uh, most people have the attention span of a goldfish on the internet, so uh, I'm going to call it quits for now. See ya!